Uh, before I entered the service, I was working in a machine shop, uh, making pistons for cars. That was, and that was about it. And it was from that experience that I decided I wasn't going to stay in there. I wanted to get a little more action in my life and possibly see a, a career path. I was uh, operating as a, a jet mechanic through the Air Force and, and I had enlisted in 63. So my training didn't start. I didn't actually start working as a mechanic until 64. So the war didn't start for me until 1968. I worked at a company called Underwriters Laboratories, uh, testing for public safety. If you look on a lot of electrical equipment, you'll see a little circle uh, decal that says UL, Underwriters Laboratories. That means it's been tested and approved for public use. I was a farm boy, I grew up on a farm, and when something broke, we fixed it, okay? <laughs> like I learned to weld when I was 14 years old. I learned to drive when I was about six years old, <laughs> like that, you know? I did my basic training at Truex Field in Madison, and, uh, and I was mechanic there. So I said, well, if I'm going to serve and give my life, I would like to give it for my country. So I said, I might as well join. And so I did. I wanted to go to MSU, MSOE because it's a highly ranked school. And because of being a highly ranked school, and I, it cost a lot more than going like to say uh, MATC or something like that. So I couldn't go full time. The, because I wasn't going full time, I uh, got drafted. I won the first lottery. <laughs> I was just out of high school, and I turned 19 right after graduation. And nobody would hire me because I was draftable. They were afraid I'd start the job and I'd be drafted right away. So I wasn't doing much. I was. Uh... I graduated from Rufus King High School in Milwaukee in 1951. And <clears throat> I had to wait a half year to go into college. Now for my, the money I needed to uh, go to college there, I earned at Henneke Steel, a bridge making company in Milwaukee. And after about three months of working there and going to college then, I got a job at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in the engraving department, mixing their chemicals. Um, that I did for about three or four months until I was able to get into the Air Force. Uh, I was working for uh, Rex Nord as a sales correspondent uh, until I received my draft notice in February, uh, December of 1951. All right, I was in construction and then after construction, I went home and my number was up because back then they drafted you. And my number was up to be drafted instead of going to the army. I went into the service, I went into the Navy. The early weeks of the training again, like I say, were technical schools. Mm -hmm. so training learning different systems, hydraulics, uh, with, with uh, simulators that showed me how all the systems work. And as a flight engineer, you had to know what every valve did, what every pump did. You had to know that because as you're flying, something goes wrong, you need to pinpoint what it is so you can run an appropriate checklist to fix it. Um, was this kind of excited to get involved with something I never dreamed of as a kid, mm -hmm. to be working on and, and inspecting and doing things with multi-million dollar airplanes in the Air Force was kind of exciting. And one of the neater things through school is that we had an opportunity to witness a flyby of one of the Air Force's most uh, newest aircraft and that was a b-58 hustler is what the name of it was it was a four engine high speed jet that was capable of 
delivering an atomic bomb if necessary. In 1969, they did a, dra a lottery to make it a more fair system. And I had number 34. They took your birthday and they drew them out. And uh, I had number 34. And uh, March 13th, which is a Friday, by the way, Friday the 13th, I got, uh, got, my, I got drafted and I went into the Army right away. You were at home all those years and now you left and you were basically all alone, away from the family. So it's quite a, it was quite an adjustment. Well, for me, it wasn't that, that bad, really. Uh, I, w I wouldn't say it hard. For one thing, I never had to perform duties of people that were stationed there regularly. I was always detached. So uh, after I, <clears throat> while I was in City Sleeming, as I said, I had plenty of free time to do whatever I wanted. Well, I, I don't know if you can ever be prepared for what happens, but uh, I think the training I had had was excellent. Uh, and uh, I think it made me more aware of what's required and what we had to do in the case of uh, confrontations. Went through basic training that you always do. Get your hair cut and everything called cut off, whatever. Dan and I, uh, I, w I thought I was going somewhere, but I ended up going back to San Diego and going through sonar school at San Diego. And from there, I went to New London to submarine school. And after that, everything fell into place. My contribution? Oh boy. Well, number one, I gave him four years of my life for a bit. <laughs> one other thing I thought was kind of interesting, we had a, a railroad crossing. Uh, you come into our base. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of our uh, vehicles got hit by a train. So I and the commander went on the railroad track and did some mm. insulating and took some bolts apart on the track. And we made it so that when the train went across the track, it would close the circuit and light on light and make it flash. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Probably the fact that I, I helped uh, maintain communication. And I, that was my job to make sure that mm -hmm. the communicate between the guys that are giving the orders and we are the guys that can do it. Also, uh, I was part of a gymnastics who joined us all in the company that was the afternoon. And uh, it was our job to ashore and maintain uh, communication between the beach and the ship. Just being able to be part of the logistics in the Air Force with delivering with our aircraft supplies, munitions, equipment, personnel to Vietnam to support that particular conflict. And one of the neatest things I ever saw inside of my airplane were two brand new Huey helicopters that they had to angle in and fit them, collapse the blades, but the aircraft took two brand new helicopters overseas. It did my job. You know, I didn't, and I never got into trouble. You know, I got promoted fairly quick for a guy that wasn't trained in that particular unit. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I just, I did my, I did what I had to do. Let's put it that way. Like I said, I was drafted. I didn't exactly, wasn't best enthusiastic about doing this, but I'm proud I did it. I would say the most important contribution I had was what I learned in service, how to be a better person. And uh, I met so many great G, other GIs and some of them, of course, uh, were uh, killed while I was over there. And so uh, it was a great experience and something I'll always relish and enjoy. And uh, if I had to do it over again, I'd probably go into service again. Transferring from the military to civilian was a little different. Back then, uh, 
the Vietnam War was going strong and people didn't like it. And there was no celebration, no nothing. I come back and that was it. You, you, you found your job and, and uh, that was what you did. You tried to keep your family fed. When you grew up with a strict father, it wasn't that different. Uh, except uh, it was a longer day and it was a little more physical and basic training, but it didn't take that much to adjust and know that you could do the things that were asked of you to do, mm -hmm. the ability to work with others and also to be independent of others, uh, to take care of yourself or to help out someone else. So it wasn't that bad. Uh, some people just, those that were drafted into the army, a lot of them didn't want to be there. But because I enlisted, I said, yes, I will do this. Uh, I went in with a different attitude and it worked out well. It probably took a month or two until I found out uh, what I wanted to do for a living, you know. Mm -hmm. And I tried a couple different jobs and and finally settled with a job that I stayed with for 38 years. The space program was what I was working in, and uh, we did the guidance system for the moon landing. The guys that landed on the moon, we built the guidance system. It was the job that I really enjoyed it because I got to fabricate the, the thing and put mount the parts in it and then do all the wiring and then all the testing for the specs of the engineer that was sitting behind that darn desk that I didn't want to get stuck behind. And so I just enjoyed my whole life there. And it was just wonderful, wonderful. As Vietnam was winding down, more and more guys were coming back to Fort Riley. When we came back from Germany, there was guys in our, in our beds. You know, they, they were putting uh, make, uh, squad rooms where all of a sudden having eight, nine guys in them instead of four, you know. So all of a sudden, uh, the Army had too many guys. Well, who did they want to get rid of? <laughs> the guy that I only had, you know, five or six months to go. Uh, wasn't trained, as a member, but I was a good soldier and I did my job. Uh, so in December um, of 1971, the, the first sergeant called us out and, for, and he said, okay, he read off about eight or nine names. He says, these are your papers, clear post, you're out of the army. And on March 20, or excuse me, December 23rd, 1971, I got out. So out. Christmas present. So I only served one year, 21, one year, 10 months and 21 days. It was very different, unusual, because you had lost all your contacts and then my family moved from um, mid city of Milwaukee to western Milwaukee and it was new neighbors and new friends. It was very strange and it was scary because uh, all of a sudden one day you you're you know you're so used to having your bed your food your job your this or that and then the next then there's this one day when they hand you a piece of paper and say you're out and you walk through that gate and you, you, you're just, you're kind of stumped, you know, for a while. I, I grew up in a small town outside of Baltimore, Maryland. And mm -hmm. a, a lot of connections with different types of people, uh, different races, different ethnicities. We didn't have that. Uh, in the service, I found out that there are a lot of different people I mean, there are a lot of different races, a lot of different ideas, uh, a lot of differences. However, when you're in the service, you're all the same. Don't judge a guy by the way he looks. Mm -hmm. Don't cheer, don't uh, judge a, a book by its cover. And if you treat people the way you would expect them to treat you, then they will. The golden rule is, is a big uh, factor there. Responsibility uh, was the biggest part. Here's here's a wrench. Go fix this on the airplane. Okay, I'm responsible to get it done right. Discipline is a, is a key role 
and it should apply to everyone from high school kids, elementary, whatever, all the way up through college, discipline will get you where you want to go. And if you have a dream, you got to pursue your dream. I pursued mine and I'm, I'm where I want to be right now. So those things, yes, they're, they're very important uh, life lessons, if you will. You gotta learn to trust your friends. You gotta learn to help. You gotta learn to help people a little bit more. Uh, I, I guess uh, it was so much, I don't know how to put it, um, baloney floating around in the military and stuff like that. Uh, learn to be an honest man. Because if you want to live the baloney lives like a lot of those guys did, you're going to be in trouble for the rest of your life. You know? but, uh, no, I just think getting along with everybody. And when you came out, like I said, I grew, I grew up. It's how to keep friendships. That is probably my life lesson that I learned. How to take care of yourself, how to live alone. You find in the service that uh, you're asked to do some things that uh, you wouldn't ordinarily do. It gives you an inner strength, you might say. Um, I love the fact that I had the seven years altogether of military service. I felt that I grown from it. I can be proud of it. There were times, as a matter of fact, that uh, I really enjoyed it. I learned that uh, you can't have things your own way whenever you want them. And you have to take what's given to you. Serve your country, you know. Be loyal to your country, you know, that's important.